Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to the Microsoft 365 Virtual Marathon. We're at mile marker 7.5. What I'd like to do is welcome AJ to the stage here and talk about identity in the cloud. AJ, all yours. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, maybe even good night, depending on where you are. Uh, and thanks for uh, choosing to attend this session over the next 50 minutes or so. My goal is to essentially help you understand you know, why identity is so important as you move to the cloud, and then more importantly, how do you go about protecting it? Um, with that, I just want to go through a few initial slides here. <clears throat> so obviously this year with everything you know, that's going on, it's hard to have any in-person conferences, but there is a awesome conference starting next year between March 23rd through March 25th, oh, too far, uh, which is the the uh, new SharePoint conference that's happening. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that's the one. Um, so please mark your calendar. It's going to be the new Microsoft 365 conference. It's going to be in Las Vegas, Nevada, the MGM grant. So definitely mark your calendars for that. Um, and then obviously with any event, you know, it's hard to make it a success without our generous sponsors. And so please do check out their, you know, their websites and, and definitely huge Thank you to all the sponsors in you know, Proficient Core View. Oh, nice slides keep moving forward for some reason. Uh, Proficient Core View, AppPoint, Affirma, Quizcom, Velo, Internet, Soup, Point Fire, Tigraph, and Cirosoft. And then also as part of everything that's been going on across the world, you know, it's uh, it's very important to support our unsung heroes, the folks on front line that are treating patients and helping them in recover. And so if you can at all, please try and make some make some donations here. Mm -hmm. Mike, I have no idea why my slides keep advancing on their own. <laughs> Not sure what's going on here. Um, but please do make some donations if you can. We, we would definitely appreciate that. Um, and then finally, as well, you know, as you you um, you know attend your you, you know all your conferences, if you can stop by this link and answer a few questions, you definitely stand a chance to win the Oculus Quest uh, device. Uh, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, so please do um, stop by this link and answer the questions as best as you can for for a chance to win. Uh, and and with, as with any event, uh, we definitely solicit your feedback. So if you can, you know, feedback for both me as a speaker and for the event, if you could stop by and access those links, we would definitely appreciate that. So with that, I uh, just wanted to, to, to do a quick intro about me. Uh, my name is Ajay Iyer. I am the uh, Modern Workplace Technical Architect at the Microsoft Technology Center here in St. Louis, Missouri. I am from St. Louis, Missouri. Well, I'm actually from India, but uh, have been living in, in St. Louis, Missouri in the United States for about actually 14 years now um, and uh, loving every part of it, actually. Um, my Twitter handle is IRAJ1 if you want to find me on Twitter. Uh, I try to post stuff about technology ever so often, so feel free to check it out. Um, I've been working, I started off in the SharePoint field. I have been doing SharePoint since the year 2006. That's not version 2006, that's just since the year. Um, so got to experience some of the pains and joys of the early days of SharePoint. Um, but what I have been doing lately though is a lot of uh, security in the Microsoft 365 stack. So security compliance and everything that comes around identity uh, teams, obviously, and then information governance, which is basically sort of one of the key pillars of everything that we try to do in our jobs today, right? Keeping our data safe. Um, so definitely feel free to ask me any of the questions on those topics as well. Uh, one thing I don't want you to ask me questions about is licensing. Um, and it's sort of a, a tongue in cheek thing, but uh, licensing, as you all understand, is super duper complicated and would require someone to have a PhD in licensing or in order to speak to it um, intelligently. And I'm not one of those, but I will do my best where I can to answer any questions on that topic. So with that, Microsoft 365 security. So if you know with any organization, the number one thing that everyone's trying to protect and keep safe is ultimately their data, right? And which is when back in the day when things were all on premises, you would have these beautiful firewalls that you would have to essentially create this walled garden to keep your data safe. The reality is that as you as we keep making our journey 
into the cloud and store more of our emails and, and data and documents and applications even, um, the concept of a firewall is, so, is sort of fading away. And so what that means though, is that your means of securing this data is less about the firewall and more about the identity and the authentication mechanism used to access the data, right? The fact that I can be working from home, which I am, and have less of a reliance on VPN and more on the fact that I have direct access to the internet, maybe through split tunneling you know, in my VPN. And essentially, VPN just becomes one of the variables, but it's not the only variable that defines whether I am allowed to authenticate and access this piece of information. So identity definitely becomes the core component at that point. And then once once that happens, right, from, from this chart's perspective, it's a fact that once you establish identity and access, it's then about how do I take all the events that, that bubble up from each of these different systems and start to create some kind of correlation of those to see which of these events led to potentially a single incident. So being able to do the incident correlation based on those events and essentially allow you to A, detect those threats, and then hopefully be able to able to respond in some kind of automation automated fashion. And then thirdly, um, it's a fact that with these data points and with these automated incident responses that occur, being able to have access to tools that let you do things like forensics. So how do I get into the fact that this thing occurred? Impossible travel may have happened. Let's dig into where did the attack originate from? What was the impact surface of that attack? How many devices, potential users may have been, been compromised, things of that nature. That's the whole security management aspects of things as well that essentially sort of in, are included in your day-to-day -day life cycle of what you do with regards to keeping your data safe. So with that, right, this, some of you may have seen this slide already, but, and this is actually fairly dated now, but the fact that 81% of breaches, and this, this came out of a Verizon report, if I'm not mistaken, but the fact that 81% of these breaches are essentially caused by credential theft. So being able to understand that four out of five attacks are happening because of some kind of misconfiguration in terms of how my users authenticate into my applications is massive, right? And there are, and it becomes so crucial at that point that you put the right checks and balances in place to make sure people are authenticating in a safe and secure fashion. 73% of passwords are duplicates, right? Let's face it, most of us hate using passwords. At home, I, I use LastPass because I don't wanna be in the business of keeping the same password across all my different services because if one of those get compromised, I risk everything else being compromised, right? And then the fact that almost 80% of employees are using non-approved applications for work, right? And so who doesn't do that, by the way, right? I mean, the fact that I'm trying to access, let's say Gmail or Yahoo or something like that, which technically isn't approved by my IT organization. And so those things just happen. And, it, and it's, 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 it's about the fact that you need to recognize it's happening and be prepared to address the risks that are occurring as a result. So with that, another cliche term, right? Identity is the new control plane. If we are playing bingo right now, I'd be checking a lot of boxes right now. Uh, but identity is in fact the new control plane in that it, it's the identity of a user that helps identify whether or not they should be able to access a, a, a given service or, a, or an application or, or a piece of data, right? The fact that I have my data essentially sitting in all different kinds of Office 365 cloud applications, could be apps that are sitting in, in Azure, could be apps sitting in AWS, could be apps sitting in Box, Dropbox, G Suite, all over the place. So across all those apps, how do I essentially tie it all to a single identity, a single user, a single version of me, and being able to protect that is what this is all about. Then you introduce other factors, things like with, with again with the cloud enabling other scenarios i can bring in now an extra net scenario where i can bring in partners i can bring in my customers think of a law firm that has its own customers how can i essentially invite my customers to access our portal where we share documents and exchange documents but at the same time i'm not in the business 
of creating and managing their usernames and passwords, letting them have the luxury of using their credential that they prefer, but managing the access of the credentials to data that's sitting in my environment, right? That's the new scenario that is enabled and, and you now have to factor that in as part of your overall risk protection strategy. Um, and finally, it's the fact that all of this doesn't just apply for cloud anymore. It's a fact that this identity based access model needs to get extended even for your on prem applications, which still sit behind a data center, but that does not make them impervious to these kind of attacks, especially in the modern world. If you think about insider risk being a major player in, 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 in these data breaches, how can I be keeping a keen eye not just on external attack but also attacks that uh, that 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 originate from from in, from within the environment and so leveraging that model for a modern based identity and access management solution and extending it for on prem applications will actually if anything boost up your your overall uh, threat protection um, posture if you will and we'll get into some of those details uh, in the upcoming slides. All right, so Azure Active Directory, right? The fact that you are attending a session on Microsoft 365, uh, Azure Active Directory is naturally the platform for, for, for creating and managing identities. So in the cloud world, if you think about what Azure AD offers, it's the fact that you have the ability now to A, modernize your access. What that means is uh, scenarios where my applications were using some form of legacy auth be it NTLM, um, LDAP, some kind of form-based authentication. It's very hard to enforce some of these new modern controls around you know, identity protection, things like multi-factor authentication, biometric, things of that nature, right? So how can I now take those, those access scenarios and modernize them into using SAML, using modern auth, and leveraging things like single sign-on where you know, as a user, I don't have to you know, log in multiple times, which again, increase the, the level of risks of those credential thefts. So that becomes a big part of it. Um, some of you who have already, you know, made the made the journey to the cloud are familiar with Azure AD Connect, being that, 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 um, that application that keeps your identities in sync, your on-prem AD identities with your cloud identities, right? So things of that nature, that whole aspect of modernization is again a huge aspect of Azure AD, right? But then there's a next aspect of it, which is once the identities have been, have been provisioned, once the, uh, the single sign-on connectivity is already in place, how do I secure it? And more importantly, how do I govern it? I mean, you think about governance, it's, it's not just about how do you create some guardrails on it, but it's also along the lines of how do I do onboarding and offboarding? Of, of my of my users the fact that is there any kind of automation currently uh, let's in let's take for example my my hr system happens to be workday which is a saas offering and that's where all my candidates become employees using some kind of a a flag from workday that can trigger a workflow in my environment that spins up an azure ad account for this employee ties it to their, their hiring manager, which again comes from Workday, and then using that whole workflow to then create tickets and 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 assign licenses, spin up mailboxes, spin up OneDrives, things of that nature, right? That all of those things sort of are 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 are, are part of that governance strategy from an identity perspective. And then the other aspect of it being as you as you think about offboarding these employees, wh what does that look like, right? Is there something I can do from an automation standpoint to kind of um, make that be more seamless, make that be more clean so that I'm not really relying on a whole bunch of, um, you know, orphaned accounts and things of that nature, right? Which again are becoming very crucial in your overall security posture. The third aspect, becomes the as the the ability to connect multiple applications to a, a single common identity platform and then enabling co you know, different collaboration scenarios as a result so some of you who are 
who are still, you know, kind of dealing with those needs in an on-prem world, things are a little difficult, right? How do I enable external scenarios with with, with my partners and my, and my vendors without having to create an overcomplicated solution, right? The fact that being an Azure AD, being able to share externally, albeit in a secure fashion, but being able to share externally, and if I'm looking for more robustness in terms of uh, having a large base of customers that need to manage their own sign in credentials and things of that nature being able to do things like b2c and creating separate customer facing tenant that can be that can have options like self-service in registering and signing in and thing and and opening up with linkedin authentication or facebook authentication or google authentication things of that nature those aspects and scenarios suddenly get unlocked right and then finally it's the fact that as i develop new applications Thinking cloud first, how can I integrate um, those applications to leverage this directory that's sitting in Azure now and using that as my primary IDP, my primary identity provider, so that the access management components of it are already part of this large identity uh, platform that we've already built, right? And then not to mention, and some, I will get to some of this in, in, in some of the future slides, but things like leveraging the Microsoft Graph, right, which is this um, machine learning model that's sitting in our cloud that is essentially doing end user behavioral analytics and building this database essentially of activities around each user to create a more tailored and customized experience. All of those are being powered by Azure Active Directory. So. Uh, once again, this uh, may seem a bit salesy and marketing-y, but um, it's very important to call out because the fact that we are offering these 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 uh, services from a security standpoint is the reason why on the enterprise side of things we are seeing such adoption of it. It's not just a fact that well it is Microsoft, it is Active Directory, so we are forced to do it. It's a fact that they're doing it voluntarily because of those security controls that are already in place, which is why we're seeing such wide adoption across the globe. So uh, I'll move past this slide. Once again, I just want to call this out real quick is in the context of, 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 of establishing trust, Microsoft is built on trust and it is extended not just in our words, but also in our actions in terms of how we protect each of our physical data centers with multi-layer protection and the fact that we are not only providing that we are providing that in tandem with a geo redundant infrastructure as well as you know leveraging some of the new modern security standards in order to make sure that there's no and there's no kind of physical attacks against the data centers right so it's all it's about creating this so that we can we can build on our trust with our customers um, I, I, I won't spend too much time on this, but I, I, I and I'll share these slides with you as well for your reference. But the the list of different compliance controls for our our, our Microsoft 365 ecosystem is just growing almost every month. Uh, I just had a customer last week who was <clears throat> on the U.S. government side working with our GCC High tenant, and there were a few compliance controls that they had to absolutely meet. And so it was so refreshing for us to say, you know what, we are actually doing that and let me show you that right here, right? So um, both from standard of government compliance as well as from a privacy perspective, you know, being 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 super committed to GDPR and actually sh in reflecting that in our compliance controls is one of the strong suits in, in, in you know, at least in my opinion, so. Um, this to me is the money slide, if, you know, if, if there was ever one. So if you think about the fact that when I mentioned earlier, we have these machine learning models that are that are that are constantly providing a more tailored experience uh, in, around each identity. There's another aspect of it called the intelligent security graph. Just like any machine learning model, what makes it a success or failure in being able to predict something is data and more importantly, good data. That is one area that Microsoft does not have any shortage of, and that is reflected by this slide right here, which is this is the data set that is feeding our intelligent security graph to be able to accurately predict for the most part, but accurately predict what is a real threat versus what is a perceived threat 
versus something that really is more of a false positive. And so what that, what that means is just, for example, if I were to look at emails, I'm going to enable my laser pointer here. And just as an email, as an example, the fact that on an average, we are analyzing close to 400 billion emails every day. And when I say analyze, it's the fact that it's not just about reading the emails, that which we don't, which we don't do, but it's the fact that we are, we are analyzing the metadata of the emails. We, we, are, we are analyzing the headers of the emails. We're analyzing things like have those mailboxes um, had any custom uh, suspicious mail, you know, mailbox forwarding rules, things of that nature. And how are those attacks getting more and more sophisticated? It's being able to see those building that into into our, our machine learning model and then more importantly sharing it across all our customers that are in the Microsoft 365 ecosystem. Another great example of the data feed for a graph is the fact that we have close to 450 billion monthly authentications and that is a massive number if you think about the, the number of authentications that occur and the thing is here that that authentication isn't just in terms of your Azure AD authentication, but it's also on the consumer side with your live authentications, your, your Microsoft account authentications that occur for your Outlook emails, could be happening for any services that are tied to your Microsoft account or this massive gaming industry that we have with the Xbox ecosystem. So taking all the data feeds there, and then applying that into our security graph is again what makes what separates us from the rest when it comes to threats. And the fact that being Microsoft, right, and you know we've got a massive target painter on our back in terms of people trying to attack us, and 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 so that gives us visibility into close to a billion threats that we detect on devices every month, right? So that that's that's the data that is what ultimately separates us and gives us that confidence that we are right up there with the other players when it comes to threat protection and keeping your data safe keeping your identity safe and where that comes in is with this slide right here so if you think about this when i mentioned at the, at the very beginning of this uh, session was the fact that in a, in a traditional on-prem world you were controlling you know ident your access control in your application based on ip address if i'm inside the network i'm in outside the network doesn't work i have to vpn in right so there was a sense of of implied access that you had that you that you know that once you vpn in i'm in right i'm assuming you are safe you're, you have unfettered access, right? And there were some controls people did in terms of the fact that, well, it's got to be from corporate owned device, right? And that's going to have a, a third based VPN of some kind. So it's not just anybody with a device that can download the VPN client and they're in, right? There was some, there was some security to it and that's totally fair. But the reality is that as we move into this cloud world, as we move to the world where most, if not all of us are now working from home, the fact that that's happening, my 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 attack vectors are now increasing because the expectation is that I should not be able to connect to applications without having VPN in. And the reason for that is twofold. Your new the, the newer workforce likes to have fewer hurdles in, in terms of trying to access what they have to. If I'm going to pull up a Teams meeting, I don't want a VPN first and then go to my Teams client and then join the meeting. Or if I'm on my personal phone, how do I VPN in and then join a Teams call. Am I always on VPN? And if 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 so, what sort of privacy do I have on my personal device? Right. So there are all those those scenarios that pop up now. And so there's the other factor also that that most organizations don't have you know, hadn't planned for almost 95 to 100 percent of the workforce working through VPN, which means the VPN tunnels are clogged up. You know, I've had so many customer calls where there's jitter, there's frozen video, and sometimes, I kid you not, I have a customer tell me that they cannot share the screens because they risk getting dropped off the call because the bandwidth does not handle it anymore. And so in that world where the four-walled, you know, firewall doesn't matter anymore, how can I extend it beyond that? So to that effect, 
This slide essentially talks about essentially including four different vectors, four different variables if you think about it. The fact that first it's about how do I log in? Is it Azure AD? Is it through ADFS? Is it coming through a personal Microsoft account that's been where something was shared out externally and is being accessed through a live account or an Outlook.com account? Or finally, could also be where you are now working with this partner, this contractor, this vendor who happens to be on the Google platform or happens to be using Google Suite. And so Google ID, which is their enterprise um, identity platform, right? That could very well be the case. And at which point you can extend authentication to that platform as well, right? So that could definitely be one variable is what account you use to sign in. The second variable has to be the device and the platform that you're using. Are you on an Android device? Are you on iOS? Are you on Mac OS? Are you on Windows, right? Um, the final point, and I kind of kept separately, is the fact that it's not just about being on Windows or Mac or iOS or Android. It's the fact that can I now also see a tiered level of access control based on what other security configurations you have on those platforms, which are now being extended by Defender ATP. Defender ATP, if you if you weren't aware, <clears throat> which is our antivirus, endpoint protection, enterprise detection and response, I mean, an enterprise detection remediation, and um, Yuba, which is end user behavioral analytics, it does all of those things. But we now have that Defender ATP service running not only in Windows, but Mac OS, iOS, and even Android. And so if I have that and I have some security baselines tied with that service, how can I now further extend the security posture of my user as they sign in from those devices? Those are things that I can now factor in as variables before I decide whether you sign in or not. The third variable here becomes obviously location. Am I a corporate network, meaning I'm inside the network, I'm inside the building, I'm inside the physical premises, uh, which means I have hardwired access through to my network. Great, right? Most people, if I when I ask them what are your MFA policies, they tell me on-prem, if I'm into the network, no MFA, off network, MFA, right? And that works. I totally get it. But where you can extend this now is the fact that Let's take it a bit more. Let's say corporate network, sure, but that should not be the only only way of allowing or enforcing MFA or not. Let's look at other factors as well, right? So corporate network can be one one option. Um, a geolocation could be another option where I have defined a known uh, set of IP ranges that belong to my VPN tunnels that maybe are being used. Uh, let's say in uh, south, you know. Southeast United States, um, Europe, you know, Asia, Middle East, uh, Australia, New Zealand, all those parts of the world. And so those IP ranges can be included in your, in your known geolocations. But there's a third aspect here as well, where, like I mentioned earlier, we are kind of using a machine learning model around you as a user. It's the fact that as you start working from home, as an example, being able to track that IP address of your home network ISP and being able to see consistent successful logins from the IP address and establishing that IP address as a known location for you as a user is the value add where I can now say somebody signing in from my home now right with my account is actually a known location that was initially not defined by IT. So that becomes now another variable I can include in this mix to establish you are in fact who you are and that you are allowed to have access to this, right? And then finally, the fourth variable can be how are you accessing these applications and services? How are you accessing email? Is it through the Outlook tech client? Is it be is it through Office, Web, Office Outlook Web Access through a browser? Okay, depending on whether it's a tech client, whether it's a browser, there's an there's an there's an aspect of what's less risky and what's more risky. The third scenario could be what if it's Outlook Web Access from a Tor browser? Still Outlook Web Access, but from a Tor browser. Uh, I'm not sure what I feel about that, right? But now you've as you can see, it's not just 
this one variable that defines whether you have access or not. It's not just about where you log in from. It's about taking this in tandem with this and this and this to essentially take it all into consideration. Take all the existing policies that you've already built inside of your Azure AD environment at, with regards to conditional access, but applying this machine learning model from it from the slide I showed earlier, taking all the data feeds and doing some kind of evaluation to see is this a safe or an unsafe login. Just to give you an example, um, a scenario could very well be that someone's using an Azure AD account, perfectly legitimate, right? They're coming from a Windows device that's domain joined, right? So it's got Defender ATP and everything's great, but it's coming from, let's say, a Starbucks or better yet, it's coming from India. I'll give you a very real example. Uh, this time last year, I was traveling to India with my five year old at the time on a vacation and stressed out as I was thinking about a 28 hour plane ride with my five year old. Um, I left my Microsoft device at home here in St. Louis and I had a couple of calls I had to take with my customers while I was going to be in India and so I had to borrow my sister's laptop which she was running Windows 7 so naturally I had to upgrade her to Windows 10, Windows 10 which at the time was I think 19 or 3 if I'm not mistaken and I have an Office 365 uh, per home subscription for my personal you know, for my family so I added her to that got Office Pro Plus got Outlook installed but then trying to access my emails, trying to access Teams, trying to access my SharePoint sites, trying to access my OneNote, right? That was a challenge because I checked all the boxes. I checked all the boxes here, but this was a completely unknown location for me. And so I actually had to go through three separate MFA prompts before I could actually be in a workable state on my sister's laptop, right? I still use all the approved applications, but this factor was so dis it's so different, right? That it threw up all kinds of alerts, I'm sure, in our internal Azure AD, which is why I got all those prompts. But that's where things are changing, is the fact that that was okay because those were scenarios that could have potentially been malicious in nature, and I had to go through several layers of being able to prove myself before I had access to something, right? And so to that effect, but what happens is that this real this machine learning model in tandem with the real-time evaluation engine is essentially building a risk score real time based on any or all of these variables. If any of these are not safe, my risk level goes from green to amber to red. And depending on whether it's green or amber or red, I can define what should happen next, which is if it's all green, you know what? You've proven yourself, everything's been validated, allow access. But the other scenario being Azure AD sign in, Android device, but it's a rooted Android device. So they've got super SU on it and they have all kinds of backdoors to bypass all my security controls. If it's rooted, I'm sorry, block access straight away. No questions asked, right? Or let's assume it is Azure AD, it's Windows 10, everything's safe, right? But I happen to see the fact that I logged in from St. Louis, right? 45 minutes ago, but suddenly I'm seeing a login activity for my account all the way from India, right? There's no conceivable way that I could sign log in from St. Louis and then 45 minutes later sign in from India. So, so that's what we would call impossible travel, where it's basically a precursor for potential credential theft, which at which point I'm going to automatically, my, my risk score goes in the red, and I will be forced to have a password reset because this is essentially credential theft that's that's occurred, right? So force a password reset, everything, all access gets revoked right away. The enforcement is near real time. And this is essentially what we talk about automated incident response that happens within the Microsoft 365 platform, right? So to, so to that effect, you can take any or all of these variables and essentially use this automated machine learning process to have a tiered level of access in terms of do I allow or block? It doesn't have to be binary anymore. It can be the fact that I allow it, but I allow limited access where it's all just over, just browser based. You can't do anything on a, on a tech client or it's going to require MFA or it's going to require a password reset 
or the last scenario that companies use quite a bit as well is they create all these modern security controls, but none of those matter if if the app that's requesting access is still using legacy auth. So you can then use another control in there to say, you know what, I have these things in place and I'm actually also blocking legacy auth as part of this. And then finally, when you think about all of these controls that you that you can now start leveraging to protect your identity, which again, like we said earlier, was a, was in your control plane, you can take this to protect not just Microsoft Cloud services, but also third-party cloud, like I said earlier, your Dropbox, Salesforce, ServiceNow, Workday. The, there's a list of close to 3,000 applications that you can start integrating with Azure AD and extending these controls to it. But then more importantly, you can also start extending these controls down to on-prem applications as well, using something called as an, an, an Azure AD application proxy, which is nothing but a, a think of it like a like a VM or two that runs in your data center, but is essentially responsible for translating your legacy auth applications to now start leveraging modern auth. So taking these modern auth controls, but extending it down to your on-prem systems so that you have now a single pane of glass, a single view into any and all login activity into your environment. So that's again a lot in one slide, but I just want to emphasize this real quick as well, that this is again where things are changing and why identity is so important and, and how you go about kind of protecting it, right? You protect this, you start protecting your data. It goes a long way in doing that. Um, the other aspect of this, right? So everything we've been talking about so far is basically relying on the fact that it's, it's, it's about zero trust. It's about assume you're in a breach state and then think about how do you challenge every, every time to prove you are who you are, right? So to that effect, and I say this to every customer I meet with every day, have you turned on MFA? <laughs> and the reason I ask that is, believe it or not, I'm MFA is, is very capable of preventing close to 99.9% .9 of your identity attacks. Not 100%, never 100%, but comes very close to that, right? Now there's also a concept of MFA fatigue, where you constantly pepper your employees with MFA prompts, and they have this habitual thing, muscle memory, of approve, approve, approve. We don't want to have that. That's why conditional access based on some intelligence is super important but you still should definitely be thinking about doing MFA if you aren't already. Again, there are different ways and means to do it. Push notification using the Authenticator app, SMS, which I personally don't recommend, but it is still an option. It's better than nothing, right? You know, voice calls, uh, OAuth, so physical tokens as well, or just having OAuth codes on your Authenticator app as well. Uh, the other thing that we also are highly uh, recommending we are slowly seeing some traction across our customers is the world where as part of zero trust employees don't even have to use a password right so it's the whole idea of going passwordless windows 10 has had that for for a decent amount of time with windows hello where just like your iphones have face id and touch id windows 10 allows you to sign in with biometric with your face using an infrared camera or a fingerprint reader and basically saying this is how you sign in without ever using a password. And even if you don't have any of those biometrics on a device, you still have the option to use Windows Hello with a pin, right? All it requires is a trusted platform module chip, a TPM chip, which most modern, I would say even modern, most laptops have it these days. If you're looking at a, a laptop that's about four years old at least, it's definitely even got a TPM chip, which means you can still do Windows Hello and do pin authentication, which is still better than having to use a password. And the reason for that being, the pins are always stored on the device only inside the TPM chip in an encrypted fashion, which means even if the pins are stolen, those pins mean absolutely nothing for a remote attacker. Unless they have physical access to your device, those pins mean nothing. Passwords, on the other hand, not the same story, right? So hence the pins are super important. Do you also have a scenario where where you get prompted for, for a username, you put in the username in, but you never see a password screen. What you instead see is a, is a, a two digit code, and then you get a prompt on the Authenticator app with three options of two digit, two digit codes. You match the number on screen with what's on your phone, voila, you're in, no password. And the third scenario being leveraging FIDO2 keys 
and there are several brands out there that support it, uh, but Fido two keys becomes another way of having some kind of multi-factor authentication without having to use a password. So if you aren't doing it, think and think about it, uh, you know, being able to leverage things like Intune for modern device management and taking hello configuration as part of that becomes a huge uh, 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 step in the direction of going passwordless and keeping your, your identity secure. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, identity is in fact a new control plane, right? So just kind of want to bring it all back together, right? So you cannot take a single identity and use that as a determining force in saying whether or not you have access to a cloud application or not. Again, you taking into consideration all the other variables that we talked about earlier. In terms of some takeaways, right? The five big things, in my opinion, that you need to be thinking about as you try to protect yourself against those threats. Strengthen credentials. If I haven't said this before, I'll say it again, MFA, 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 right? But also being able to reduce your attack surface, right? So things like legacy authentication, so, you know, the number of times that has come up as a reason, as a backdoor for someone to get into environment and then lateral movement into a privileged account, domain gets compromised. Those things happen way too often, especially with the insider threats that are occurring more and more. So, so if at all possible, as you move towards the journey towards cloud-based authentication, Azure AD, or the modern auth, being able to also put in the controls to block legacy auth will be a huge step in that direction. Automated threat response. I tell this to a lot of my customers, my, my big customers and my medium-sized customers and my small-sized customers who are running lean shops that you know automated incident response, automated threat response is crucial in this modern world. There's no longer the concept of a golden hour after a breach where you have an hour before data leaks start to happen. That hour has been shrunk down to minutes because of modern computing being so powerful, right? And internet speeds being that fast, upload speeds being in the gigs now. So automated response becomes crucial in mitigating the, the damage that occurs after a breach, right? Uh, increasing awareness. We can't stress this enough, right? Technology can only do, do so much, but how do you increase awareness among your employees and then, and then educate your security teams, your operations teams, your SOC essentially, on how do you audit events? How do you look at these alerts and have some kind of a, um, a SIM in place that helps you start doing the correlation and then creating these playbooks that let you do the automation that needs to happen in case of a certain incident, right? So those are again things that are extremely crucial that you should be thinking about doing. And then finally, you know, self-help. <laughs> so how do you how do you how do you train your end users to be more um, educated on these different um, sophisticated and sometimes not even that sophisticated social engineering attacks that occur? You know, things like, hey, you know, I posted my birthday on Twitter and someone can take that information, take some other piece of information from another app we checked in and use those to correlate and essentially request a password reset on your behalf, right? So just kind of educating employees on just those good general best practices. Again, little things that go a long way. And then finally, uh, I, I'm uh, I'm getting close to my time here, so I'll speed this up a bit. But I'm I'm gonna try and show you the slide. Some of you may have seen it already. Uh, it's publicly posted, but it's basically our Microsoft's cybersecurity reference architecture, right? In terms of um, the, if you look at the entire suite of things that we do across everything in the cloud. From, a, from identity and access management to data protection to information governance, identity and access management. How do you uh, manage your endpoints, you know, both managed or unmanaged, right? Uh, th things like, especially in, in the world we live in, when you're hybrid cloud, right? How do I, um, I'm gonna actually, I hate build slides by the way, but uh, I never know when I'm done. Um, here we go. So across this whole ecosystem, what are the different things that Microsoft is thinking about and trying to do to keep you safe, right? Keep you secure, but it's a shared responsibility. I think Joanne said this in, in, her, in her session earlier, it's a, it is a shared responsibility model. So I can do what I can from a security perspective, but my end users have to do some things. My 
my cloud provider has to do something. So how can we all be in this journey together to keep our data safe, keep our environment safe? So this is public information. If you just look up online on Bing for Microsoft cybersecurity reference architecture, this is a great uh, diagram with some with some great content that uh, speaks to it, right? So uh, that's just that. And on that note, I just wanted to say thank you again for uh, uh, sticking with me for the last 44 minutes. Um, again, like I said earlier, these are links. If you would, I would appreciate it if you could give me feedback uh, as well as the event as well. So if you have anything that we can do to improve, uh, please